we have a couple pages of people on so we can get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Hopefully, uh, you all had a happy new year. Glad to see a lot of you here. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that today starts the new way to get CME credit for Grand Rounds, where you have to text uh, a number 7688 to a telephone number. Um, if you, Francine will continue to put in the um, instructions on how to do that. I did it um, and it's very easy to do once you set up and I just texted and got a response that it's being recorded. So just uh, any issues, reach out to Francine. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Levin to introduce Dr. Jen. Emily, you're up. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, for 2022. Today, we're joined by Dr. Eric Jenden, who holds many roles here at Mount Sinai, including that of Dr. Isidore Freisner, endowed professor and system chair of the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, professor of neurosurgery and professor of immunology, and director of the Head and Neck and Thyroid Cancer Center at the Mount Sinai Hospital. Dr. Jenden oversees numerous clinical trials conducted at the NCI-funded Cancer Center, as well as an NIH-funded basic science laboratory studying the immunobiology of the trachea, and he recently performed the first human tracheal transplantation here at Mount Sinai. A very warm welcome to Dr. Jenden this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I'll um, let me sh screen share uh, and... Make sure you can see this. So, can you see the 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 page, or is this appropriate, or do you see this the uh, presenter view? I think it's a presenter view. I think it's, it has both slides on it. It does. I don't know how to. Let me see if I can get. Um, uh, there you go. You got. That's good. Oh, is that right? Okay. Now you're good. Yep. It's, it's it's only taken me two years. I'm so <laughs> exactly. So I want to thank everybody. First of all, happy New Year to everybody, and hopefully, uh, in spite of the start of this year with the the variants, things are going to get better, and we're going to become a little more acclimated. Um, I want to share with you, and I'm going to move through relatively quickly because there's a lot of information, and we're going to stick with the mostly clinical aspect of this, touching very basic and, and uh, superficially on some of the science behind it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, single-staged uh, human tracheal transplant and, and why this is a relatively important issue. But, but really, this speaks to um, probably a much greater topic, which is vascularized composite allograft uh, transplantation and, and what the future holds uh, in terms of taking complex organs um, from the eye uh, to the ear um, to parathyroid, and the list goes on and on of opportunities um, to provide patients with uh, transplanted tissue that we simply can't reconstruct or even medicinally can't manage. So we'll, we'll touch on that toward the end. Um, for uh, those of you who um, uh, don't know, we performed a, a tracheal transplant uh, as of January 13th. It'll be one year ago. Um, this recipient was a middle-aged female. She was actually in healthcare. Um, she had, had uh, intubation uh, emergently uh, for an asthma attack. She has severe asthma. And they, they, you know, as not uncommon, damaged the upper airway, and the trachea. And, and as a result, she um, had attempts, six major surgical procedures uh, to repair and reconstruct this. Um, eventually what happened is they kept putting in a longer and longer tracheostomy tube, creating damage all the way down to about two centimeters above the carina. Um, she was completely confined uh, to her uh, uh, apartment. Uh, she couldn't really leave. Um, she was having almost daily uh, obstruction events and once or twice a month would have a life-threatening event where she would obstruct. Um, so her quality of life had been almost uh, limited to her bedroom and it was re really quite a problem. The, 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 the stenosis and the disease that you see here in the trachea extended from a complete stenosis just below the vocal cords to two centimeters above the um, carina 
Um, the you know this this represents a major problem because she's otherwise a, a relatively healthy woman. And in fact, you know, kind of in the middle of COVID, January a year ago, she had become so severe that we really had no choice um, but to kind of move ahead. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The trachea, you know, is is kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of organs. Not very sexy. Um, it, it's this tube. It doesn't get a lot of respect. Um, and so I, I, you know, it's not a, a, a very exciting thing to talk about, but nonetheless, it's important. And, and I'll explain why, but the airway can get damaged from a variety of, you know, possibilities. Iatrogenic intubation, we just talked about burn injuries. Um, there are about four, uh, 450 to 500 children born annually with tracheoesophageal um, congenital defects that are not compatible with life. And that's actually how we got into this. Um, you're seeing, we see a tremendous amount of long segment airway problems related to COVID and COVID related injury, and of course, malignancy. When the, the, the disease affects the upper cervical trachea, um, patients can be left with long segment defects. This is a 33 year old woman. She has three children. She's not able to voice her kids have never heard her speak. Um, uh, and yet when it involves the lower segment, we oftentimes will treat these patients with long extended tracheostomies. Defects or, or problems in the, in the airway that extend upper and lower are typically not compatible with life um, because these stents, these tracheostomy tubes obstruct, they, they don't allow for the normal physiology of the airway, which we'll talk about in a second. And, you know, tracheostomies and trachs and, and airway can sometimes be a mystery to those of you who aren't dealing with it all the time. But, you know, we place tracheostomies, as you know, all the time, whether it's for disease or in the ICU. And these tubes come into the airway and the cuff is supposed to sit, as you see in this cartoon. And the cuff pressures are really important for, for many years. We had extensive defects as a result of overinflated cuffs. What inevitably happens in patients with long-term tracheostomies, because really this is supposed to be an interim treatment, is that the tracheostomy tube starts to damage the wall. You know, it's just not natural to have this alloplast in the airway. And the damage um, initially begins upper trachea where the tube and the tip is presented. And then over the course of time, in order to get through it, you know, you develop these stenoses, these, 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 these airway obstruction um, as a result of scarring. And what do you do? You dilate it and you put the tracheostomy tube even further down. And before you know it, you have a long segment defect, which is why tracheostomies are not designed, you know, for a, a long-term solution. Um, this is what the normal airway looks like in the upper right. And you can see the stenosis that we see regularly. Every, every week in, in clinic, we see these patients and it's this damage of a tracheostomy tube. Now, some of you, particularly in the pulmonary area, and we've talked with Tim Harkin and his whole team about this. Well, what about stents, right? Stents are, 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 are a, a, what we consider a palliative procedure because once you enter through that doorway of placing a stent, um, it's almost impossible to go back. These stents that look terrific are designed for palliative what happens is they inspissate with, with bacteria, they become a biofilm. Because they're alloplastic, they're largely metal, they tend to erode. This is a post-mortem uh, erode into the great vessels right next to the, to the trachea and the airway. And ultimately, um, they lead to fatalities as a result of extensive hemorrhage. So they're not, they're not really where we wanna be. And, and for those of us who deal with the airway a lot, that's clear. Now, in, in small defects of the trachea, which we're thankfully most commonly, you know, dealing with, you can resect the segment and then close it up um, primarily. And that's called a tracheal resection. And that's a pretty straightforward procedure. And we do many, many of those. Um, the problem is when the defect is longer than, than really four or five centimeters, um, the extensive defects that are four or five centimeters, you can manage this way, but they can be challenging. Defects greater than five centimeters um, represent a clinical dilemma. And this was work that was done uh, back in the early mid-60s by uh, Hermes Grillo up at, at Boston. Um, 
And he defined this quite clearly, and it's held true for more than a, you know, half a century. The approach to managing these defects has an interesting history. And, and, and just briefly, in, in the early 50s, uh, late 40s, people tried to use fascia to manage these defects. And they found that without a rigid structure, um, the, the airway inspir inspiratory pressures of uh, you know, 120, 130 millimeters um, of water would, would cause collapse of the airway. And that suggested, look, you need a rigid structure if you're going to reconstruct lung defects. In the, in the 60s and in early 70s, the introduction of alloplastics uh, seemed like they would be ideal. I mean, the trachea looks like a tube, just put a, a plastic tube in there. But in fact, these things eroded into the surrounding tissue. Uh, they caused hemorrhage. They became biofilms infected and extruded. And it, and it highlighted the fact that we need to biointegrate something if you're going to replace the airway. And then in the 80s, our group and many other groups used this uh, treated trachea. It's human trachea. It's uh, treated to destroy and, and rid the, uh, the, the tissue of immunogenic uh, proteins. The problem here is that um, this doesn't have functional epithelium. And even though the trachea seems like a tube, um, the epithelium is critically important in pulmonary hygiene, moving the mucus and the particulate matter out of the lungs up to the upper airway. And these patients um, would obstruct. And so through the history, we defined in the early 2000s that if we were going to reconstruct long segment tracheal defects, the tenants were a rigid construct, something that would biologically integrate, and something that would support functional ciliated epithelium. And we felt that those were really critical. You don't get these from stents. And so we defined in the literature in our laboratory that, look, in order to get this, you needed vascular supply. And the only way you're going to do that is really with tracheal transplantation. You just can't reconstruct um, complex organ systems like the kidney, the liver, and even though it doesn't seem, the trachea, um, using alloplasts uh, and, you know, or, or other forms of non-functional. The problem here was that we couldn't identify a vascular supply to the trachea. The kidney has the renal artery in, the renal vein out, liver very similar, obviously the heart, but we didn't and we couldn't identify a vascular supply. And, and this work goes back again to Hermes Grillo, who was really um, the giant up at Mass General for, for 60 years, who I had the um, uh, opportunity to train with. And in the early 60s, he, he did some work looking at the blood supply, and it became dictum, uh, academic dictum. There is no way to reestablish blood supply to the trachea. And when I spent time up at, in Boston with him, you know, I, I was very interested in transplantation, you know, and I was a student here, and we had, you know, an exciting group doing transplants. He, he would not hear any of it. His, his, he was very clear, listen, we've done the work, you can't revascularize this organ, and that's the way it is. And um, it, it kind of speaks to the danger of, of academic dictum, not, not questioning some of what's out there. And so we did a lot of work going all the way back into some of the early anatomic drawings and dissections in the, in, in, you know, from uh, Bougerie and others. And, and what you'll see, even though this is not exactly perfectly depicted, the inferior uh, thyroid artery runs through the muscular esophagus and then into the trachea. And using this kind of information, we started doing injection studies on humans and on canines. And this in the canine laboratory, we performed a series of autographs and a series of allographs um, in canines long segment tracheas, and we were able to establish um, blood flow to the trachea. And we reported this um, and, and we, we defined that we could actually revascularize the trachea if we kept uh, two things in place. One was the thyroid gland because the superior thyroid artery and vein run through it. And the second is the inferior thyroid artery and a segment of the muscular esophagus the blood supply runs through the esophagus and then into the trachea in this segmental way. And this was something that was not our discovery. It was something that was depicted back in the 1800s on the anatomic dissections. Um, we just kind of reiterated this and brought it to life with some of the more conventional uh, injection and anatomic work.
we were um, ready to launch a tracheal transplant program in 2006. We had, uh, for the first time, defined the blood supply. Um, we, we had done some of the basic science, which I'll touch on later. And we felt that the patients with severe, life-threatening, long-segment tracheal defects, um, the ones with tracheoesophageal fistula, you know, these were patients that were dying um, and, and really we had nothing to offer them. We were ready to go. And literally, as we were submitting the paperwork for the introduction of this program um, that coincided with the clearance on vascular con uh, composite allograft, um, the regenerative medicine uh, stem cell biology uh, trend hit and literally overnight, we saw reports of people growing ears in the backs of nude mice. We saw hearts, cardiac valves being grown in Petri dishes. And, and of course, we saw tracheas being made in bioreactors. And um, with this, we realized that if you can create something that looks like a trachea, um, in a laboratory dish in a bioreactor, as they called it, um, and could implant it. Valves, trachea, why do we need to subject these patients to immunosuppression? And it, it really called into question, why would we do conventional transplantation if we could use this stem cell and regenerative medicine to get where we needed to go? And we literally shut down the laboratory I went into a, a depression because kind of the work I had done up to this point really all seemed for naught. For those of you who kept track of this, a guy named Paolo Maccarini, who was at the uh, Karolinska at the time, was the one who was doing this work. And he had this thing called a bioreactor, very fancy stuff, stem cell implants. He was creating these things that looked like trachea. And we were up in the, in the meeting up in Boston at the American uh, uh, tr tr Transplant Congress. And he was presenting his work up there and he was just about to do clinical transplants. And a member of our laboratory kind of stood up and asked the question, well, are you able to achieve ciliated epithelium in this thing? It certainly looks like a trachea, but does it function like one? And he, um, he reprimanded us for questioning uh, the, the question and, and suggested that we weren't familiar with the science um, but yet his data never really showed that he had functional epithelium. And for those of you who know the story, um, he performed a series of these in children and adults, and they all um, died as a result of airway obstruction. He had achieved a rigid construct and something that arguably might biologically integrate, but it didn't have functional epithelium. And as a result, they obstructed um, highlighting the very important part of the functional epithelium uh, in the trachea, it's not just a tube. Um, the cilia beat at a very specific um, pattern and they uh, provide hygiene uh, to the lungs, which is critical to pulmonary function. And there was a series of articles in Nature um, questioning the, the scandal and, and the lessons that should have been learned from the, the people that questioned his science. He's lost his license and has spent some prison time. And uh, there's a very interesting article in Vanity Fair that outlines exactly the extent of his uh, fraud. And interestingly, for some reason, there has been this history of, of attempts to transplant the trachea that date back 80 years with fraudulent uh, reports. And, and this really brought it all to a head. So you can imagine the kind of pressure that we were under when we said we want to transplant the trachea just on the tails of something like this. Um, Sandy Florman and the Transplant Institute and, and all of the wonderful people there supported the reapplication and the institution of, of this program. The recipient, as I told you, um, came to us. Uh, it was about two years before we found the right um, donor and, and, and really felt that the recipient was appropriate. Um, the donor was a male into a female recipient, and I'll explain why we waited for that um, and why that was so important. Um, she had gotten significantly worse, as I said, about a year ago. She, um, the recipient prep included um, CDC 
complement um, dependent cytotoxicity and, and flow cytometry uh, cross matches. There was no evidence of donor specific antibodies. So we felt we had a good match. Um, what we did was uh, we had both the uh, procurement in, in one operating room here at Mount Sinai and the next operating room directly next to it was where we um, performed the uh, transplant. Um, it was really facilitated um, and coordinated uh, by a terrific group of people in the Transplant Institute who just did an amazing job. Um, we, we perfused the allograft, the trachea, the thyroid with University of Wisconsin solution um, prior to uh, uh, procuring uh, the trachea with a thyroid and a portion of the muscularis of the esophagus. And again, um, what we did was we split the muscularis and removed the mucosa. And this is what the allograft kind of looked like going in. The, the whole segment was 11 and a half centimeters, including the cricoid cartilage. Um, and um, we performed a microvascular anastomosis uh, with a series of uh, arteries, uh, um, including the thyroid and lingual artery and uh, jugular veins um, to, to re-vascularize uh, the allograft. Um, the ischemic time, a warm ischemic time, which is the time that we're actually doing the microvascular surgery was 26 minutes. And the, it was 78 minutes from the time we took the allograft to actually implanting it into the patient. Um, we gave the patient, the recipient, uh, antithymocyte, uh, globulin, and uh, standard triple therapy, tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and, and corticosteroids. We left a small port open here, not quite this big. This is where we put the endotracheal tube during the reconstruction. But we left a small port about the size of a pencil so we could do bedside bronchoscopies. Again, you have to remember, we did not know if this allograft was going to survive. We didn't know if we were going to be able to revascularize it. And so we watched it very carefully um, and did Bronx two, three, four times a day. Early in the timeline, um, the we um, used uh, uh, endoscopic measurements of the blood flow to demonstrate very good vascularization throughout the mucosa and throughout the allograft. Um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, we performed bedside uh, endoscopy demonstrating very nice um, vascularization. And this is the, uh, the, the donor segment. Um, by day six, the biopsies had lost the ciliated epithelium. Um, and we saw this on EM as well as H and E, and that meant that we had to suction the patient quite a bit because, as I just told you, the importance of the ciliated epithelium is to to move the um, move the uh, secretions out of the lungs and through the trachea up to the upper airway. And so she had a tremendous amount of crusting and inspissated muco uh, uh, secretions. But very quickly by day eighteen, she started to sprout ciliated epithelium. And literally within three weeks, she was moving her own secretions out and we were suctioning less and less. We performed biopsies. And very interestingly, as I, as I alluded to, we placed in a male donor segment into the female recipient. And what we were seeing was that the female recipient, her mucosa was growing into the donor segment. So there was a migration of a recipient female mucosa into the donor. And at day 18, we had 0.4% of her lining entering into the, to the recipient. By day 42, we had completely seen reinstitution of normal ciliated lining. She could move dye. We would do dye experiments where we drop them in distally. She'd move dye all the way up. And now the amount of her epithelium into the donor segment was six and a half percent. And by the time we hit day 86, 79% of this graft was composed of the donor of the recipient lining. Her airway went from something that looked like this to this. And the cytogenetics demonstrated that the allograft was becoming an immunologic chimera. Um, a very interesting um, finding. Now, you should understand that vascularized composite allografts, which include face transplants, hand transplant, um, bowel or, or, or abdominal cavity wall, 
they have a very high rejection rate. Um, 80% reject acutely um, and 50% reject chronically. In spite of that, this VCA allograft did not reject at all. So up to, we have day 86 laid up here, but we've been now a year out. Um, we've been measuring her free cell DNA. She's had no bumps and that suggests inflammatory rejection response. She's been at almost zero undetectable. Um, she's had no episodes of, of acute or chronic rejection, which would typically demonstrate as blebs and, and, and erythema uh, of the lining. And so it's very curious to us that this is very different than the other VCA transplants. And it may be this immunologic chimeric state that has developed. We weren't totally surprised because back in the early 2000s, working with Lloyd Mayer, when I came back, I was at Wash U for seven years. And when I came back from St. Louis, we transferred all of our research up here. And Lloyd was my, my, my research mentor. And um, what we found in the, we, we had created this uh, mouse transplant model. And uh, we do these little teeny mouse transplants. And it would work out very well because you could use knockouts and and um, a bunch of different interesting experiments, but we would transplant the mouse trachea in. And if the, if the graft survived, you get nice epithelium. And if it rejected, they would, they would obstruct. And um, we, we use that model to really study the immunobiology and the epithelial biology of these tracheal transplants. We found that, um, that the lining of the trachea was the expressive site of the MHC class one antigen. And so it was the lining of the trachea and some subepithelial glandular uh, stem cell niches in the trachea. These were the only sites that really expressed MHC class one. And so the idea that the lining of the trachea is the target of rejection and the lining of the trachea may be transitioning from recipient, you know, from donor to recipient is a very interesting concept. And we were able to demonstrate this in some of our research in, in the early 2000s, that in the mouse model, the graft would completely be replaced with recipient lining. And you could watch this happening using reporter mice. And we found also that when we transplanted the trachea into a recipient mouse, we'd go uh, a valve into C57, that over the course with immunosuppression, over the course of a few weeks, it would completely switch over and in fact, you could, um, you could uh, withdraw immunosuppression and that graft would live. So we were able to develop some form of, whether you call it a tolerance or a resistance to rejection. Um, these grafts, once they converted over, the way we're seeing and what we've seen in our human recipient, that you could withdraw immunosuppression and the graft would survive. The cilia, um, are critically important to the whole concept of tracheal transplantation. You know, without this cilia, you lose the ability, as I mentioned, to clear the lungs. And in fact, in the mouse model, we were able to place dye distally and it would traverse the transplanted segment when the graft was immunosuppressed. And in contrast, if the graft was rejecting, the dye would not transpose and would not move all the way up. And we did these studies in our recipient. And sure enough, she passed the dye straight through the graft segment. And so unfortunately, I don't know that this video will play, but it's a microendoscopy. I don't think it'll play demonstrating that the cilia beat at 1300 beats per minute, they move directionally and they're very, very consistent. So in the mouse, if you place in the trachea backwards, the, the lining will beat the wrong way and the graft will obstruct and the mouse will succumb. And, and the reason I bring this up is because the ciliate is critically important to these, these allografts. And what's also interesting is the fact that it's getting replaced over time may suggest a completely new paradigm in terms of transplanting these patients and even de-escalating immunosuppression. That's very important because as I said earlier, some four to 500 kids are born annually um, with, uh, with tracheal defects. And it would be nice to be able to one day provide transplantation as an option, but even nicer uh, to be able to withdraw immunosuppression over the lifetime of this child.
So we've learned a lot in, in just this brief kind of experience. It, it's a junction between transplant immunology, epithelial science, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on stem cell science, but we've learned that first of all, really for the first time ever, you can transplant a trachea. And in spite of the dogma um, that you can't, that existed uh, for half a century, um, you know, there is a way to do this. And we feel that it's very reliable. We've learned that standard immunosuppression is effective and maybe arguably more effective than we need. Um, immunosuppression is changing uh, significantly um, and, and that's going to open the world up to all forms of transplants um, for things we've never considered before. Um, if there are ways to achieve rejection resistance or tolerance, um, that might be very interesting as we're not going to expose patients to the toxicity associated with standard immunosuppression. We, we found that the graft sloughs epithelium, um, but that it repopulates in a chimeric fashion. This Grala graft um, is becoming part recipient. And if we can maintain that state, we may be able to de-escalate immunosuppression or withdraw it altogether. Um, so where do we go from here? You know, our lab is focused on a couple of very interesting ideas. One, you know, how far can we push this resistance to rejection? Could we take our recipients in the future and maybe de-escalate immunosuppression and monitor for rejection? Um, we're looking in the laboratory, the, the impact of this immunologic chimeric state, and, and does it create a local tolerance, uh, a resistance, or a systemic um, uh, uh, immune tolerance. Um, we're also looking at the idea that, you know, we, we tend to break the world into a very um, uh, bipolar fashion where you, 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 you either have uh, stem cell and, and um, uh, developed uh, organs or, or transplants, but actually I, I think that we may have a very interesting opportunity to combine the two we may be able to take these transplanted organs and, and uh, implant them with stem cell allografts, particularly here in the epithelium. Um, and the implant of, of, of isogenic stem cell epithelium may be a very interesting way to seed the graft and kind of push it off uh, into the chimeric state, which may decrease the risk of rejection and the need for immunosuppression. And then finally, we're looking very carefully, you know, not only with the escalating immunosuppression, which would be critical for these patients, but what about topical immunosuppression? If the epithelium is the site of rejection and the target, would it be possible uh, to use an inhaled uh, uh, agent? And so there's, there's a lot of very, very interesting work to be done here. And we look forward to it. You know, um, I, I should arguably put this slide first. Um, this work and getting this procedure done uh, was work that started in 1989. Uh, it's been a long, long haul, and there's been some very, very important people. I, I present to you today, but make no mistake about it. Um, you know, everybody from Lloyd Mayer and Susan McKinnon, and the list goes on and on. I, I could give a lecture to the people that uh, Joel Cooper uh, back at WashU, uh, who did the first single and the first double lung transplant up in Toronto, was a very important advocate for this. Um, people here at Sinai, from the entire Transplant Institute to the surgical group, but also the basic science group, um, as well as the medical team, Tim Harkin and his team, and, and Mary Beth. Um, so, so, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to present. It's a very difficult uh, discussion to present because it's a huge topic. Um, and the basic science discussions are very different than the clinical. So I try to sprinkle the two in to give reference and context to kind of what we have done and where we hope to go. But I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Eric. That was just extremely impressive on your groundbreaking work. And really appreciate you presenting to the department. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Jenden, comments? We'll see, how does this fit into the uh, 
evolving lung transplant program currently. Yeah. So Scott Shinen and, and uh, Harish and the team that just got recruited here to do lung transplants, um, we're working together. You know, the, we, we're creating a Institute for Airway Sciences, which many members of the Department of Medicine are going to be involved in transplant. And, um, you know, their major problem with lung transplants is uh, rejection, but also stenosis uh, at the, at the uh, anastomotic site. So what we're looking to do is, is hopefully work together to create a combined program. A lot of these patients have combined disease, both lung and trachea. And, and this may provide hopefully an opportunity, not only to study uh, lung transplant as it relates to uh, the immunobiology, but also the clinical side, you know, for those really sick patients. Um, the other issue here is the application of this is really step one. A lot of the sickest patients we see have tracheoesophageal fistula, uh, the communication between the trachea and the esophagus. And, and that's a group of patients that we hope um, we should be able to, uh, to affect as well. Gotcha. Looks like there are a couple questions coming in now. Hoping that would happen. Uh, let's see. No, that's Francie. Um, Fred, actually, can you re well, explain a little bit how you got the cilia to be in the right direction? So the, you know, it's interesting, right? The, um, when you transplant in the trachea, if you transplant it in isotopically so that it's in the correct, uh, you know, uh, uh, direction, in other words, you don't flip it. Um, the basal cells that regenerate the cilia and epithelial cells, they serve as one of the two sources of stem cell. They clearly know what to do, right? They're programmed to, to, to differentiate into ciliated cells that beat not only directionally, but exactly uh, in concert with the other cilia. So you can watch the, the, the dye move right through the graft segment. It won't do that early on until the cilia has regenerated. Um, so it speaks to kind of the idea of, uh, you know, you transplant in a kidney and, and, and how does the glomerular filtration system know to kind of take on? It's already there. We slough the epithelium and it's probably ischemic, uh, but the basal cells that regenerate and differentiate into cilia, uh, ciliated cells um, are programmed to do this. And so they, they do it automatically. So there's not much you need to do. Like I said, interestingly, if you flip it and you do it backwards, the cilia will beat in the wrong direction and that will cause either the mouse or the dog to obstruct. So it's, it's, it's implanted in the basal cells uh, in the basement membrane of, of, the, of the graft which way directionally the, the cilia needs to beat. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Which raises the question, if you put in stem cell implants, are you going to get them to beat in the proper direction? And are they going to take on, you know, the, 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 the functional uh, airway that you're trying to achieve? Mm. And we don't know that answer. Gotcha. Uh, there's another comment and question. Congratulations on a great achievement. Fascinating presentation. If I understood correctly, the transplant includes donor thyroid. Does that function? So, yeah, and that's why there's so much to this. The, the um, answer is we think it does, right? Um, you, you don't know because you've got the feedback loop. So your thyroglobulin and your TSH will feed back and, and maintain. But what we did have happen is the patient developed uh, hyperparathyroidism. So... Um, the PTH rose um, and the patient became hypercalcemic. Now you, you would say, well, wait a minute, we've been raised to believe that the PTH has a feedback loop, it's gonna drop. And you know, unless you have uh, hypercellular parathyroids or an adenoma, that shouldn't happen. But it does raise the question, you know, maybe that's not as simple as that. When we transplant that you know, graft in, it comes with the thyroid and the parathyroids. The thyroid, hormone levels remained within normal limits, but the parathyroid hormone went up and, and she became hypercalcemic. So we've had to, you know, you know, manage her, uh, uh, her, you know, parathyroid disease more than her thyroid disease. And if we were ever going to really start to think about de-escalating immunosuppression, withdrawing it all together, we'd probably go back in and do a thyroidectomy and parathyroidectomy. Um, Take it out. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, there's a question, uh, did the prior work on esophageal transplant offer any insights that you could use in tracheal transplants? No, you know, esophagus hasn't been very successful alone because the blood supply issue has been a real issue. So, you know, there, we, we haven't been able to do real esophageal transplants. You know, you may be able to pull the colon up or pull up the stomach, but to, to, to isolate and, and uh, transplant the esophagus alone, these two are interdependent. The blood supply flows through both the organs. So even when I transplant in the trachea, I'm taking a piece of the muscular esophagus to make that, to, to keep that blood supply intact. And, and, and more likely, you know, if you were going to do an esophageal transplant, you'd probably have to keep some form of the trachea in place. The two are interdependent. Appear. That's at least how it appears. Gotcha. And then um, Dr. Greenberg asks, is there any infiltration of the immune system into the transplant, either initially or later? And if so, which type? So you're talking about uh, is there the, early on in the first 10 days, we saw inflammatory infiltrate. So there was an increase in, you know, inflammatory infiltrate. Hard to know, you know, uh, because this is an N of one, you know, uh, is this a rejection response? It, you know, is it an inflammatory response? But interestingly, by, you know, day 21, um, the biopsies were completely normal. There was no infiltrate. There was no evidence of erythema topically. There was no change in blood supply. There was no evidence of, of, of either rejection or inflammation. So it quickly settled out. That, that's a very odd, you know, that's an odd finding because as for those of you who know, in, in typical VCA, hand, face, everything else, they battle, number one problem they battle is rejection, probably because the high dendritic cell um, uh, concentration within the lining of the skin. Um, well, there's a high dendritic cell concentration in the lining of the, of the epithelium of the trachea. So it, it, it calls into question with the sloughing, do we lose the dendritic cells? And maybe this is, there's not direct allo recognition isn't the main source of rejection here. But one of the things we're looking at now is exosome uh, release and a and, and, and semi-direct uh, form of rejection. So it, it's a very odd situation and you, you have to believe that at some level, um, the chimeric state is responsible uh, for the, the tolerance as it were. And, and it does raise the question, could this be exploited for other forms of transplant um, to try to stave off rejection? Mm -hmm. And how do you evaluate the donor trachea? That it's yeah. So the donor segment. So yeah. there's a couple of ways. You know, one is um, we you can do bedside bronchoscopies three, four, five times a day because we leave a small port at the top that we close later. Um, two, we do biopsies. So we just we do bronchoscopic biopsies, and you can do those at bedside. Tim Harkin was doing those for us. Uh, in the Bronx suite, simply because we really wanted to get high resolution uh, evaluations. We do E&M um, and we do cytogenetics. Um, so, and how about prior to the transplant? So prior, so prior to the transplant for the preoperative workup, you know, one of the things we do is we get a thyroid ultrasound. We need to make sure there's no thyroid cancer there because that's coming with the graft. Mm -hmm. Typically we'll do all of the standard, uh, you know, we'll do a bronch and a fungal uh, bacterial, uh, to make sure that there isn't active infection, but that's really about it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Other, uh, any other comments or questions? You, everybody stuck around for the whole presentation, Eric, so that's how I know they were very interested. <laughs> so thank you again, really very much for coming in and presenting to the department. Just terrific work and congratulations to you and, all, and your team and everyone that works with you. No, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. And, you know, again, I think that, um, well, this is an interesting case. It, it speaks to maybe what's going to be coming down the line on a larger scale is the use of transplant for, for lots of different kinds of vascular composite allografts. So uh, thank you all very much for, for the opportunity and hopefully we'll have a chance to work together. Great. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day, everybody. Happy New Year again. You Thanks, Eric. Take bye -bye. it easy, everyone.